Hi, welcome to our Friday Town Hall. I'm Kathy Leach, Executive Director of the International Montessori Council, and on behalf of the IMC and the Montessori Foundation, I welcome you to our weekly Town Hall, our role in ending systemic and internal racism. Our focus today and for um, I think at least the, probably the next week, we will be focusing on Montessori organizations and Montessori associations. As many of you know who have been here week after week, we have been looking at our own internal racism we, and, our, and our implicit biases. We have looked at curriculum for schools, uh, for children, how to be inclusive. We've looked at schools and how we can um, frame this for our schools to be more inclusive. And now we are ready to start looking at our internal, internally at our organizations and associations. Um, as many of you know, we at IMC and Montessori Foundation have been working to, um, to look at all of our internal processes and I'm sure that we will be looking even further. I'd like to welcome several people today to our, well, first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here and giving up time on your, on your Friday afternoon. I'd like to uh, make sure that we, I welcome some of my colleagues uh, who are here. Let's see, I have Jonathan Wolf who's here with me, IMC board member, Kitty Bravo, also an IMC board member who's with us today. Um, we have uh, chair of the IMC and president of the Montessori Foundation, Tim Selden, joining us. Um, and I can't see if I have any other board members on. We have many other social justice uh, task force members who have been working with us over these past few weeks. Um, additionally, we have uh, Sarah Lavalley, who's been assisting us with, um, with our task force and all of our internal work. And we have been led over these past couple of months uh, by Dr. Cindy Acker who is the founder and head of the Child Unique um, and Alameda Montessori School in Alameda, California. Uh, Cindy has been leading us through, a, a, as I said, a, a process uh, to help us learn and grow and to help us um, have a place to share our experiences and our learnings and growth as we move through the process. I'd also like to welcome, um, because I do see a couple of our um, colleagues from the American Montessori Society here, and I'd certainly like to, to welcome Amira Mugaji. Amira is the president of the American Montessori Society board. Amira, thanks so much for being here with us today. And I see Amy Allen is here. Amy, thanks for being here. And if there's other um, uh, AMS board members, just raise your hand and I'll make sure that I introduce you. Um, I do wanna acknowledge um, AMS for the um, Black Lives Matter rally, that the virtual rally let, that took place last evening. Um, many of us participated in that and uh, really Dr. Dr. Acker also um, had a role in that and we appreciate that. It was another um, forum for us to, again, to learn and grow and to recognize that this is a process. It's a respectful process. It's not always um, the easiest process and uh, we as Montessorians know that we have the opportunity to come together and do this work together. Hard work but necessary work. So without further ado, thank you so much again for being here and I'll turn it over to Dr. Acker to get us started today. Thank you for being here and we're going to begin as we do with a moment of silence followed by some reflection. So today I want our moment of silence to be about Jacob Blake, um, yet another name, and his family and all of those worldwide who are grieving, um, and the unknown names, because for every one situation there are at least 10 to 20 other ones that are going on right now. And so I'd like that moment, this moment, to be about that.
Thank you. So have there been any thoughts or feelings that have come up um, the last week, based on the last week's town hall or just the last week? Are there any feelings that have come up from, from anyone who would like to get those out before we keep going? Uh, Cindy, I'd just like to remind everyone in case um, they're new that if you go to participants, click on participants, it will give you a virtual hand raise because it's um, hard for us to see your real hand raising with so many folks on the screen. So if you go there, you'll see the hand raise and we'll be watching for that. We have a couple people um, helping to monitor the hand raising as well as the chat box. So if you don't want to speak out loud, that's perfectly fine. We understand and we'd be happy to have any comments or questions that you'd like to be shared in the uh, in the chat box. And that icon is at the bottom of your screen as well. Um, I see An Andrea, you have your hand up. So uh, if you would unmute, we'll start with you today. I'd like to just praise um, AMS and all the IMC council members that were participating in the rally last night. Um, I saw the replay of it because I was teaching class when it occurred um, virtually. But such a delight to see that there's so much enthusiasm and concern about peace in our world. And I really appreciated that. Thank you. Thanks for your comment, Andrea. Uh, anyone else? I'm going to comment that I think it's just been a really um, difficult week. Um, I see that you know today is the anniversary anniversary of the march, and I don't know if enough attention is being given to that, or if it's just me and I haven't noticed that attention could be given to that, um, and what the what the implications of that are, and are we have we made progress in those fifty or fifty one years? Um, I think that the I think that the 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 thing that comes to mind for me is when will it stop and how long will it take? And I don't know the answer to that and I know I'm part of that and I don't know what my role is in that either. So I'm I'm working on that and I I appreciate actions and I appreciate that um in Munir's presentation last evening he he did give us some very practical ac actions and that was very helpful to me personally. Well, Kathy, believe it or not, we're going to start with the March on Washington. So Sarah, if you can share the photo. This is a colorized version um, of one of the shots from the March on Washington um, 57 years ago. Um, 59 years ago, the concept was created by Baird Rustin and another gentleman. Baird Rustin is a black gay man who was known for his advocacy for gay rights and civil rights when neither of them was popular. And so now, this is our 50th anniversary. It was also the venue in which Dr. King, um, in another area um, after the march, gave the I have a dream speech. What I want you to hear is that it was accomplished with partnership. It was built on an alliance of civil rights, labor rights, and religious organizations. And not often mentioned is a man whose name is Walter Ruther, and he was one of the major voices in getting white allies to come and join the march. What I also think is really critical to understand is that this march, which continues on today, it's every year it's commemorated and recreated. It was done because they recognized the importance of partnership in the work of social justice. As Montessorians, we just cannot think in a silo. We can't think in the silo of our classrooms. We can't think in the silo of our schools. We can't think in the silo of our associations. We have got to think larger. Racism is a man-made social construct, but the world is, the, the work that we have to do in the world is worldwide. And Montessori said that we were citizens of the world. And so we have to work together 
with our associations or we're missing the way to do this work. It's together or it's fragmented. When we look at what the NBA teams did and other organizations and entertainers in their response to Jacob Blake, they worked in unity, they worked in partnership, and so must we always. So we begin by being a part of this March on Washington. Um, and Sarah, you can start to get that ready. I'll share with you that in the Netherlands, um, my family calls me um, every year. This is actually the first year that uh, um, I haven't been called. Um, they, they call me every year because in the Netherlands, there's the National Day of Remembrance. And everyone, everywhere in the country stops. Anything that's going on stops. And there's silence countrywide. And it, it's amazing to me that, um, that when we have these isolated moments of silences, that, that if, if you actually stopped everybody all of the time to stop and remember, it becomes something that's meaningful. And so they call me up and they say, it's, it's time. And I know when I get that call that I act in solidarity with the rest of my family and the rest of the people who are in the Netherlands, and I'm silent. And so we are giving you the opportunity to be a part of the March on Washington. Sarah, can you, this is live, not his song. Are you seeing the screen, Cindy? I see the screen and I sing, I see the song. Great. No justice! Okay, but the song is later, Sarah? It, 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 it doesn't allow me to get that close to it, so I will music, music. bear with the minute of uh, the few seconds of his preamble. Okay, to... but Sarah, can you get us live to the watch this on song. Washington? Not the song. Oh. We're oh, going to do I'm that sorry. at the end. I, I apologize. I did not prep that. I'm sorry, Cindy. Okay, so when you get to it, just let me know. Okay. And then we'll go there. All right. So I'm going to um, put you in the midst of the March on Washington before we leave this town hall, because I want you to have been there. I want you to join in, uh, in the way that you can, which is our being able to see it live it has been on my screen for hours now um, so that I could be a part of it. Um, and to see that a historic moment has been going on 57 times um, and was instrumental, it, it was a march for jobs um, is, is how it began. Um, and right now it's a march for lives. And so bringing it together at that moment every single year, to me, shows us the critical point of leadership. And what you saw in that picture that Sarah showed a little bit ago were many people who were in the group, but the, the photos that we usually see about the March on Washington show the leaders in the forefront, bringing people. And some people um, would never have, have gone to the original one because they were concerned about being outed um, for someone who was making a really clear um, statement about uh, racism um, and that they might lose their jobs. And so there were a lot of people who were really fearful about showing up there, but more and more momentum just caused people to want to show up and so they did. But the people who were in the front forefront were the leadership who, who knew that partnership was important, that calling in many different peoples were, was important, and that this is a piece that we all needed to do. Uh, Sarah, why don't you just go out and watch for a little bit because people are marching now. So I asked Jonathan if he would, um, 
speak to us on leadership. It was a piece that he was going to finish up last week, but we just had so much conversation. Yep. And Thank so, you. Sarah, can you multitask? Can you at the same time show Jonathan's PowerPoint? I can't hear you, but... Um, yeah, you're muted, sir. I can show Jonathan's, but I can't search at the same time I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Kathy, if you possibly can search for March on Washington Live, and if you find it, send it to Sarah. I will do that. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Cindy. So while um, Sarah's bringing up the PowerPoint, one of the things that, of course, we all know about, but we really haven't talked about yet, is what role leaders play, not only organizational leaders, but school leaders play in transforming people compositions of schools, compositions of classrooms, curriculum, organizational culture, and outreach. And so um, I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, research on this. And it's really about that we have to have the, the courage to ask those big, difficult, and future-oriented questions. And these are just a couple that popped into my little mind. It's really getting out into the future and asking our organizations and school communities exactly what kind of a world are Montessori students today going to be entering? Uh, Cindy has pointed out to us and reminded us repeatedly in these sessions that this is a world of increasing diversity, increasing color, and our students today need to be prepared for living family life, community life, organizational life, um, in school life in a, in a, in a diverse, diverse culture. Uh, the second question become, is really an outcome question. What does a Montessori student need to experience in the prepared environment to prepare them for living and working in a world of increasing diversity and color? It's really, let's really discuss the outcomes of consciousness, character, advocacy, communication, relationship building, uh, on and on and on that students actually need to learn starting at the earliest program levels leading all the way through secondary. And then the last bold question is, if this is the required pre preparation for the future of students we are serving today, then what do we need, meaning school leaders and teachers and parents need to change in our own consciousness, looking at our own implicit biases, our school communities, policies, uh, composition, our classrooms and our curriculum. Um, I was in a, uh, town meeting a couple nights ago, a school that was just embarking on the social justice work. And at one point, uh, one of the parents said, you know, but what are we actually going to do? You know, we're, we're talking in feelings and theory. And it, it occurred to me, once we define what we want students to be and have and know in this world of diversity, then we really have to take a very introspective look at our schools as leaders and say, what's missing? What's missing in, in, in how I think about things? What's missing in my relationships? What's missing in our curriculum? What's missing in the composition of our school and our policies? And then we need to start to seriously fill in the gaps. So an article that I read several years ago, long before I became more conscious of, of what we're working on now, was an article by Ronald Heifetz and Donald Laurie in Harvard Business Review called The Work of Leadership. And I've asked Kathy uh, Leach to put this article into the chat for you. And uh, I'd like to read you, before we go to the next slide, just the, the very brief intro to this article about adaptive or transformative work of leaders, what we're tasked to do to shift people's thinking, behavior, and commitment. This is from the article, The Work of Leadership. Followers want comfort stability and solutions from their leaders. But that's babysitting. Real leaders ask hard questions and knock people out of their comfort zones. Then they manage the resulting distress. Leaders are shepherds, goes the conventional thinking, protecting their flocks from the harsh, harsh surroundings. Not so, say the authors. Leaders who truly care for their followers expose them to painful reality of their condition and demand that they fashion a response. Instead of giving people false assurance that their best is good enough, leaders insist that people surpass themselves. And rather than smoothing over conflicts, leaders force disputes to the surface. 
Few people are likely to thank the leader for stirring anxiety and uncovering conflict, but leaders who cultivate emotional fortitude soon learn what they can achieve when they maximize their followers' well-being instead of their comfort. Sarah, if we could go to the next slide. So in this article, The Work of Re Leadership, uh, which again, we will put into the chat for you, it's a 1997 article from the Harvard Business Review. Heifetz and Lori identify six principles for leading transformative change, personal, interpersonal, organizational, and educational. And the first one is a Montessori-ism. Get on the balcony. Become aware of what is going on inside yourself and others between people and in the classroom. I think before we can engage in a meaningful discussion about how we are going to change our school curricularly, culturally, policy-wise, or our, organ our Montessori organizations, we really have to take stock of where people are at, including ourselves. Number two is, is identify the adaptive challenge. What changes in thinking, language, relational, and work behaviors need to occur? One of the points that Lori and Heifetz make in the article is there's a difference between framing something as a technical change, such as, we just need to get more books with people of color into our libraries. That's a technical change. That's not really transforming the thinking about how the entire organization becomes anti-racist in their consciousness and thus in their actions. It's got to be framed as a, a mindset change leading to external action. Change brings distress. So number three is regulate distress. The job of a leader is to help people manage the stress of transformative change without defaulting to avoidance or resistance. They use the uh, analogy in this article that you have to turn the heat up to push people out of the comfort zone, but if the heat is too high and people are under too much stress, we certainly can see some of these symptoms during COVID-19 times, people melt down or become passive aggressive or resistant. So the idea is we turn the heat up and then we are really there for people as leaders to process that distress. Maintain disciplined attention, gently but firmly redirect expected tendencies toward procrastination, resistance, passive aggressive sabotage. Um, we might all get jazzed about changing our schools or organizations, but at some point with the, the honeymoon's gonna be over and, and we're gonna hit the wall. People are gonna start to get defensive, people are gonna get resistant, people are gonna get resentment. It's part of the emotional process of change and the leader needs to be prepared for helping people through that and still stay on task. Give the work back to people, identify your allies and invite them to help you carry the torch of change. I've been suggesting to school leaders and some stuff that I've been doing with schools, whether it's with parents or teachers, um, identify who your allies are early on. People who are just sort of in tune with your philosophy, in tune with your culture in terms of their personality and distribute some of the load to them and also identify who your adversaries are, the people who are gonna be more resistant and create some support as well as some boundaries for them. And then lastly, the sixth principle is protect the voices from below. Give outlier individuals and ideas an ear. Uh, they talk about at this point in the article that there's a tendency, especially when emotions are running high and really high stakes, to maintain social equilibrium in meetings. Like if somebody comes at it from a really an outlier position, some really what, what appears to be a very different idea, leaders and groups tend to want to go, well, look, we don't want to cause too much disturbance here. Let's just like bypass that. And they're saying, no, sometimes the outlier ideas are the most transformative and the most revolutionary. And it's the job of leader to protect the outlier people and their ideas to give them the ear and respect. So I would really encourage you to uh, take a look at this article, if, especially if you are a leader of a of Montessori organization or a school, because it really talks about creating a culture of learning and transformative change. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Um, one of the things that um, I read about in that article was the importance of also bringing your bringing your association along with you. Um, we we see all of the people who are here and people who are at the table, but we need to bring everybody along. 
And so we need to be aware of the members who are not at the table because they're the ones who need the most education. Um, there, there's a quote that Malcolm X um, has that I love that says, a man who stands for nothing will fail at everything. And to me, in the latent era of a pandemic of racism, an association who stands for nothing and together with others stands for no one. And so we want the togetherness. We want to be able to bring everyone together, which means that as, as a school leader, as an association leader, um, we, we have to make sure that we have the pulse on where our association members actually stand. Not just us as an association, but where are they? Um, how do they feel? And that gives us the trajectory that we may have in terms of how we have to educate people and bring them on and what we need to do in order for that to happen. There is this wonderful association called Green Lining um, that um, is based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they, they are a social justice organization and every year, every spring, Green Lining has a conference. And within that conference, they say, check yourself. There's something that is some part of the conference that allows an association to evaluate where they stand on various levels of social justice, including racism. Um, and Sarah's gonna show a couple of other tools um, that you can use on your own as a means for assessing your association and allowing other people to do the same thing. Um, but at Greenlining, you're able to, to do the work in real time um, with other people who are trying to look at themselves. Sarah, do you have that first one up? And so this is a really simple beginning. It's just the beginning of just looking at your organization, your school, your association, and just asking yourself just a handful of questions. Um, and that you do that work with yourself, but you also hand that out to other people, and then you allow for the conversation about it. Because if you don't come into the very diverse, or the yes, or the yes always, um, then it says something to your level of commitment, or it says something to how other people see you. Sarah, you can go to the next one. And then this one is one that um, just asks the various questions and scroll down, Sarah. Who makes the decisions in your, your association and how, to, to what extent are other people of color um, a part of that decision-making process, which is not just one person up at the top, but more people so that you are able to have a lens that is full and robust. Keep going, Sarah. Who controls the money that has to do with the decision making? And sometimes those are not the same people, um, but do you have the same voices reflected? Sarah, keep going. What kind of education is continually provided through the association of your organization? Which means that um, there's something that people need to continually learn about. You don't get the certificate that makes you an anti-racist. Um, you, it's work that needs to continue to go on. We, we had a lovely conversation a couple of town halls ago of a school where everyone is reading the same thing together and discussing it together. And for us to be able to continue to do that as an association, and I don't mean just throwing out some books that someone can read. I mean really, really encouraging the work and doing the work and doing check-ins about the work or doing excerpts from what it is that you're reading so that people have, have a reason for continuing to, to look at the information. Um, and what, what work does your association do in alliance with other organizations that have to do with people of color? Um, how much of a, of a partner are you? How much guidance do you seek from them rather than reinventing the wheel yourself? Sarah, go ahead. And what's your culture? What's, what's the culture of your, of your organization? Um, and it, it mentions holidays and activities that drives me bananas because, um, because it, it's not about coming up with the holidays. And it's not about um, having the children celebrate those 
um, in a classroom because, because it's through the lens of someone who does not celebrate the holiday. Um, and so it's, it's not just that. It's what does it mean to do the walk and the talk as a person of color? What does it mean to, to live the life of a person of color? And through that lens, you see, um, you see their work. I, I loved something that Ursula used to um, have us create where the, a day in the life of a child in this particular spot or that particular spot. Well, now we see totally different lived experiences of children totally different lived experiences of adults, and how much do we focus on those in our associations and allow those voices to speak and allow their experiences to, to not, be, not be limited to a small group of other people of color who share their, their experiences, and that is critical, that is also important, but that other people find out about them and that your association, your organization, takes the lead in making sure that those kinds of things happen. Sarah, go ahead. You can go to the next. And so this one, this one, I, I love this diagram because um, it asks you, how anti-racist do you wanna be? Um, what's enough for you? Um, do you wanna be a little anti-racist? Or do you want to really totally continue to do this work? Um, where, where I live, we're having difficulty with air quality because of the fires that are around us. And um, I put in a, a HEPA filter, um, air filtration system in two of our campuses. And I happen to have had a parent who was a part of air quality in the Bay Area. And I asked him, is that enough? Um, and because he was saying, you know, there are these other air filtration um, individual systems that you could put in. And I said, well, I have this air filtration system that I've put in, isn't that enough? And he said, well, that depends on how clean you want your air to be. So how, how, how committed are you to that? How clean do you want to be? A little clean, some clean, um, ideally clean? And, and it was interesting because it made me step back and say, oh, I mean, I, I thought I put in the system that everything was working. But this is the same kind of thing with this work. It's like we can continue to look at other kinds of ways, other kinds of situations in, in which we can examine the practices that we have, the things that we do, the way that we teach, um, what, what comes out of the curriculum in Montessori, and if you remember, I have been saying um, that I, I want to do the research on what would it look like if a Montessori school completely eliminated for one year everything in the classroom that had to do with white-only faces, white-only history, and that it was completely filled with people of color. What would that look like at the end of a year? And it takes courage to do that. It takes a lot to be able to do that. And we had a lot of people who said, you know, well, I don't know, what would parents say? Um, I'm, I'm fearful about that. And other schools who said, yes, let's, let's try it, let's see it. And then, and then said, you know, this, this is not so easy. And it's not so easy. But this trajectory of trying to move an organization through um, a point where we want to actually end up with a transformed, anti-racist, multicultural organization that is fully inclusive and that stands behind what it says and that looks at all of its decisions with that lens, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of commitment. But we have to ask ourselves, where do we fall in, the, in these categories and where do we want to be? And how much will that take? And are we committed to make that happen? Thank you, Sarah. Do you want the last slide, Cindy? Yeah. Oh, sorry. And this is a wonderful tool that, um, I don't know if you can put that in the chat. All of those actually could go in the chat. I'll put um, okay, um, but 
This one is, is a wonderful, it's a very, very lengthy self-assessment. And it's one that is designed for you to share with other people for them to also evaluate, but it, it, it evaluates many, many different areas of racial consciousness and racial equity. Um, and it goes on for, gosh, several, several pages, but it would scoop back up, Sarah. If you see in the um, table of contents, it just breaks it up. The first 20 questions and then the deeper questions and then more questions, the shorter, the shorter answers, the narratives, because it allows you to be able to really do the work, to really, really be reflective, to really say the things that need to get said and to see the things that need to get seen and to evaluate yourselves with, with a view toward hearing the things that are hard and doing the work in order to change them. So I, I, encourage, I encourage all of those tools um, and I encourage this one particularly to make sure that you're sending it out to all people and that you're then starting to have discussions um, with your community um, about your, your organization, about your association, about your school. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Kathy, is Andrew on? No, I don't believe Andrew's on today. He might come out at the end. He had a conflict at three. So. Okay. Um, uh, Jonathan, can you explain what, what Andrew did at his school this week? Yeah, he had uh, to kick this off, to really kick off a consciousness and a commitment to taking a look at anti-racism at the Oneness Family Peace School, the school that he founded and he's the head of. Uh, he had a community meeting, uh, was it last night or the night before? Cindy, I can't remember anymore. Yeah, two nights ago. I know, my, my week's been pretty <laughs> full. Yeah, whatever. Um, and he, he set the intention of like, we're going to make a commitment to this but we first want to hear what your thoughts are on this. And he had faculty and staff and parents there, and he just really invited people to open, you know, as Cindy has done in these meetings, to open their hearts and minds to talk about how they see this transformation at the Oneness Family School of students and staff and parents and the community leading ultimately to a change in society where there's, there's even go, ripples beyond the school. Um, and... Uh, it was a really powerful meeting um, because, again, it started with just listening to people's stories and their concerns and feelings, but all within the context of like, this is the beginning step in a thousand mile journey. We are going to take specific action. Cindy, what were your impressions of it? You were there. Um, yeah, I, th I thought it was um, quite impactful and what was um, most most impactful to me was hearing the stories of parents who had children of color or biracial children, multiracial children, and how those children felt and the words that those children used about how they were in the environment and parents wanting so much to have more children of color in the classroom just for their child and for other children so that um, so that their children wouldn't end up experiencing what they were experiencing. And, and just I want to throw in a leadership remembrance here, Cindy. Um, Andrew, who's the executive director and is head of school, Karen, at no time when people who had been, had, had multiple children in the school currently or in the past, at no time when these people talked about their rather grueling experiences of implicit bias and racism in, in this is a, a, an international peace school, at no time did the leaders get defensive. They listened. It was really impressive. It was really good listening because fingers were being pointed that this was not a great experience for my child from parents. And Andrew and Karen just listened and then reiterated, we're going to take the bull by the horns and work with this. It was very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what leadership of an association calls for. Um, so I'm curious, Kathy, if there are any comments about um, that and what we've gone through thus far. Thanks, Cindy. There's a couple of comments. Um, one was a yes, another yes, it was awesome, referring to last evening's um, AMS Black Lives Matter rally. And so I wanna make sure we acknowledge that. 
Um, happy to see Mati Watford. Uh, she was the keynote speaker at this year's Monterey Schools of Massachusetts Conference. And thank you all who put the rally together. So very inspiring. Uh, Helen says her internet is a little sketchy, but she's going to type today. She agrees with Kathy and Cindy that it's so important to be inclusive and respectful. The Dalai Lama, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, Jesus, and more advocated for peace and inclusiveness. We can still stand up for justice, but take the high road the changing, in changing the system. There's a danger of creating something just as polarizing as what we're trying to change. People will focus on the anger and not the message. We never know how and when someone has a change of heart. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and a thank you to John for the uh, leadership presentation. So again, okay. I want to remind everyone, if you'd like to put your hand up, oh, I have Claudia. Claudia, you uh, are welcome to unmute yourself and comment. And, and then, Kathy, we have the March on Washington Live up. All righty. Hi, and thank you for allowing me to come in late. I apologize. I had a meeting that didn't quite finish as fast as I thought. I, I just wanted to share something that happened to, to me this last week. I'm not no longer with a school, but I have a group of people that I do cosmic education. It's a, it's a private Facebook group. And one of my former CGMS students who's from East, she's from Chicago, but she teaches in Eswatini and she's a black woman. She put up two posts yesterday and some members of the group had some pretty strong reactions, partly because I think it didn't feel like it fit with our group conversation. And they didn't know, one person suggested we were being trolled and I knew we weren't. And so I tried to take, I guess I felt conflicted about how to respond because some of my members were saying, well, you know, this isn't about cosmic education, why is this here? And, and yet, how is it not about cosmic education? Um, and how do, we, how do we not allow conversation about anti-bias, anti-racism in that discussion? Um, so I, I wrote a statement that, that basically said, you know, I, I do monitor, I reached out to this person, I know that this is not a person that's trolling us, and, and yet I think we need to find ways to listen, and, because cosmic education is everything about peace education, so how does this not fit? Um, I don't know what will happen, I don't know if I'll lose members, I, I don't know if the people who thought it was inappropriate will feel like it's not appropriate so they don't want to participate anymore but but somehow i felt like that was a an example of how do i how do i make a stand that says well it may be out of the realm but maybe it's not so i guess i'm sharing it partly because i i had i had to make a choice about how i would deal with it and but also partly because i'm curious about how other leaders um would handle something similar where people would say, this is, does not belong here. So that's where I think it can fit in this conversation. Thank you. Um, Claudia, when you say that it didn't fit in the conversation, was it related to what was being discussed, but was it a different person's opinion or was it just something that came out of the blue? Um, it sort of came out of the blue. Um, the comment that I think put people off was um, the the conversation the the post that was made was about this young man who was, who shot the protesters just this week, and and my former student who made the comment was how how is how is this how are we as Montessori educators not talking about this? And I think she implied that we should be talking about it in our group. But, and I think she didn't know how much Montessorians are actually talking about it. And so I was able to share that with her privately. But I think there were some comments made about, well, how is this related to what we talk about typically, which is more about, well, how do we make a more interdependent cosmic curriculum and that sort of thing. And she also put up a, a post about, um, there's a new um, 
film about hearing black women in particular and and um, she was more or less recommending it. And I think some of our members just felt like, where does this fit? So I, I found myself saying, well, okay, in the context of what we typically talk about, it doesn't seem like it fits, but on the other hand, how does it not fit? So that's, that's the context. Yeah, understood. If I can comment, and then I see Jonathan wants to comment as well. You know, the one thing that I would say is that it's very easy to keep life in a box. Um, and that's part of our greatest challenge. Um, and as we're starting to hear voices of more people of color who are speaking out, um, a lot of what is being spoken now are things that have been kept in and are kept in daily. Um, I have a story that one day I will share on this town hall that has to do with my black son. Um, but it's a piece that, uh, that I hold all of the time um, and I don't bring that to conversation. And so I think, you know, I, I think that what's happening now for some people of color is that they're saying, why isn't this what you say? Why, why don't you gather a group and say, let's at least hold a moment for those voices? I mean, for, for me, it's really hard to say a voice because I know in my growing up, there were many people were being shot all the time. Um, and it was, it was our regular conversation. And it was the first, we were wondering who got shot. You know, it was the first conversation of every day um, because that's what life was like. And, and so I, I think that that's a piece. And, and that I would say for, for people who are white, know that, that that is a possibility that may come up for people of color because they're holding that. And every day hoping that there's not gonna be another one and then there is. And there's this gut-wrenching tearing inside of you that it happened again, you know, and that we're supposed to be fixing it and then it happened again. Um, and so I get that um, from that perspective. And so I hope that people will just kind of hold that, hold, hold that. So that when you have a gathering that you just give up, just give a moment. Um, because I think that's probably very much where, it, where it's at. Jonathan, you were gonna say something. Yeah, Claudia, thank you for bringing this up because I think this brings up a fundamental <laughs> philosophic issue. Is, is this really about topics or is this about an entire cultural change that needs to be infused in every conversation? So I'm wondering, Claudia, whether you're a leader of a Facebook group with Montessorians or a school or an association, that we need to have some sort of preventive or prenuptial discussions at the onset of any inquiry. Like, we're also gonna fuse this into every inquiry, regardless of what we're talking about, we're gonna keep looking at this. Is everybody okay with that? So you front load it, that if we're really committed to being anti-racist and having anti-racist children, organizations, schools, that this is gonna be a connective tissue and theme that is going to infuse every discussion we have so it doesn't come across as not topic related. It's like anti-racism. Is there anything that's not topic related about anti relate You know, it's, it, you know where I'm going. And I I'm do, and, and I appreciate it because early on in the group, which it's, we were young, a couple of months old, but something had happened and we had started these conversations and, and I saw a, a speaker and I put it out to the group that, I was moved by this speaker and if anyone wanted to talk about it, let me know. And so uh, I would say a half a dozen or so, maybe 10 people have gotten together and we have actively met every two weeks um, dealing with our own bias and looking at that and how we can become a more, um, um, uh, just, a, just a more, a conscious group of people and what all in, is involved in that and um, and so it is happening but you know she might not have known that or whatever but I, I think you're right that that it, it is a part of our group but it's not necessarily what folks are are all saying they're comfortable with and so that's a that's a thing that I have tried I wrote a, a long piece 
today saying that I thought it needed to be okay to have that part of the conversation and to listen. And, but I had not thought of that. And I asked for patience because I, I'm learning and I don't know how to, I don't anticipate how it's, you know, people are going to receive. And I think patience and having people do that. And somebody put up a comment that I saw about tone policing. And I was very aware of that, that I didn't want to tone police this woman because I knew where she was coming from. She was speaking to us because she trusted our group as a place where she could express what I think Cindy was just saying. And so I didn't want it to come out as tone policing. Absolutely. So anyway, thanks for letting me share about that. Thanks, I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Claudia. We, um, you have really inspired some conversations. So we have several people with their hands up. I'm gonna go to Amira next and then Cheryl. So Amira, if you can unmute. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the invitation to be here and thank you for having this, um, this gathering um, for the time that you're having it. So um, I guess I want to just acknowledge um, what Dr. Acker and Mr. Wolf said and um, I agree wholeheartedly what both of them said around like this is another voice. <laughs> People want to be able to say things right now in addition to this anti-racism, anti-bias really should be infused in everything that we do. And so it's always, it should always be the lens at this point, but everybody doesn't have that lens. So when I think about what Mr. Wolf just said about, was talking about leadership, one of the things that was just going through my mind and I didn't, obviously didn't interrupt and I, this is the first time attending, is that we always wanna go back and start with that foundational knowledge. Like does everybody understand what systemic racism is? Does everybody understand what institutional oppression is? Does everybody understand those things so that when someone like this young person, um, this person posted whatever she posted in the group, like does everybody kind of have that same framework of maybe even the very minimal understanding? And when you think about the continuum that, um, Dr. Actor shared, every organization and every person is at a different place. And we want to kind of try to move and we need to acknowledge where they are, which has also been mentioned, but also we all need to have like this baseline so that when we're having these conversations and when we're checking the pulse of our organization, we're checking the pulse of our, our staff members, we're checking the pulse of our parents, we minimally know we all started from A minimally everybody gets what this means. Now everybody has their own lens and everybody has their own perspective and everybody has their own life experiences, but we can go back and say, this is the vocabulary that we're using. This is what we mean when we say racism. This is what we mean when we mean foundational or in institutional racism and, and oppression. This is what we mean when we talk about people of color or is it anti-black racism or is it just racism? So it's just like, so I'm saying all this to say, I do think that Facebook play page and every Facebook group is a venue for that conversation because that conversation is happening, it's going to happen, it will continue to happen as long as people are getting shot in the street, as long as people are having their houses appraised lower because they're black or they're thought to be a, a family of color, as long as I can only rent in a particular area because of what I look like, as long as those things are happening, that conversation belongs everywhere. And so thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, thank you. Thank, thanks, Samira. And um, I, I, this is such an interesting conversation and I, I appreciate your grace, the grace that you're all um, offering for us to, to learn and catch up. And I, and I feel like, you know, we're getting a lot of this kickback. This conversation does need to happen everywhere. Um, but we are getting pushback from this. And you know, well, as I do, organizationally, we are getting told, this is too political. Why are you engaging in politics? This is, this is affecting my religious beliefs. Why would an organization go in this direction? Um, um, we get, how dare you compromise our family values? And so, um, Claudia, I'm, I'm with you. I understand that the, the position you're in to, to, you know, what do we say? How do we continue to, to stand up and if, for what we believe in? And at the same time, um, you know, hold in some respect and, and grace um, where people currently are, because that's where they are. And so to not invoke more 
misunderstanding, more injustice, and more hate. Where do we go? How do we do that? How do we invite that in gently? And I, I would say that, you know, we have role models for this. And I appreciate those of you who are, have been here and sharing and helping us with that. But we need the, you know, we're struggling with the words on how to come back to that. Um, I have a couple of people waiting. Uh, let's see, Cheryl, and then Terry, and then Kitty. And I'll keep watching for hands up. And Andrea, Kathy. Okay. Andrea's Andrea, hand was your hand up again or from before? No, but it, her, Andrea's hand came up before Kitty's. No comment. I'll okay. pass this time. Thank you. Yeah, I think hers was up from before. I'll lower that. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. And we're going to Cheryl next. Thank you. And my statement is a little bit different. Um, that I, that first picture that that you showed, Cindy, my history teacher was actually in that picture um, of the March on Washington. And when I went into education, he told me it takes courage to be a teacher. And um, and around all sorts of things, but seeing that picture reminded me think, to think back and think what courage and to use him as a role model he had to tell us in high school in it was the 80s that he was um, in there, that he had gotten arrested about the other times he had been arrested and, um, and the, the fact that he was hired as a teacher um, with this background that may or may not have been accepted um, and just the leadership of being there and telling us about this as teenagers like when i saw that picture i've seen some similar and so i recognized him and i felt such pride and then i was like i need to do i, I need to do what what he did for us and pass it on and uh, so thank you for sharing that and for bringing back those good feelings and um, and reminding me of that because our leadership is sometimes role modeling. And as teachers, I think that's really where we are. Yeah, thank you. I, I had a mentor, um, I've mentioned this to a couple of people before that when I took his classes for a few years in college, he always met us with, how did you push back on racism this week? And the fact that he would ask me that question, I needed to be really present with, how did I push back on racism this week? You know, it was like, because I'm gonna have to report, report out. Um, but the, the work that he did was so courageous. And when you say teachers are courageous, the work that he did was so courageous. And he had us, um, go into every one of our classes were not done at the university, but were done in schools in low income areas. And so I, I took my classes while the water was coming in through the ceiling from classes and where there were rats that were going back and forth while the class was going on. And he said, you need to know this stuff because you need to help your children who are living this as a regular part of their daily existence and you need to fight against the injustice of it all. Um, and until you're, until you're aware of that, then you're not really doing your full work as a teacher because you need to know where your children come from and you need to know what kind of environments they, um, they are dealing with in situations they're dealing with every day. And you need to fight against those things continually happening and affecting them and affecting others until it's no more. Thanks. We have Terry uh, waiting and then Kitty. And then I know, Cindy, you have some more things to share with us. I think this is more a question, Jonathan, from the slide you showed about when you're in conversation and anyone else, Cindy, anybody else that can comment on this. I've been in a lot of conversation. This is like my fourth group on racism this week. And so it's how do you work with that stress conversation and I'm in a new group and people are just getting to know each other and what I hear is I, I live in Jackson Tennessee excuse all the sounds uh, but um, I, I live in Jackson Tennessee and I hear I hear the, 
the strength of voices that are angry. And I think we need to hear that. I think anger is a smokescreen for hurt. And I think the hurt and the history of hurt and experiences that have happened, and especially in the area in which I live, is genuine, it's true. But how do you, when you hear this, as a white person, how do you listen and move towards relationship and how to work together as a community to move into action? It's that stress level I wanna talk about. Cindy, Amira, you wanna tackle that before I give you my two cents? <laughs> Um, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm searching for how to say that well, um, because people of color have dealt with that level of stress times 100,000, I would say, because we're often the ones who are seeing it, living it, experiencing it, um, Someone mentioned to me the other day, why do you show this stuff, um, the difficult videos? And um, I didn't show the difficult ones. I showed the ones that were pretty minor. Um, and, and, you know, there is, there, there is this, this thing. If you think about um, African culture, there is this thing within the, the nature and the culture of African people that the only thing that you can do is to move through life um, because you've, you've got to just keep going and, and you do what you do for the children and you, you do what you do because, because life calls for it and you celebrate every single thing that there is in life because that's, that's what you've got and you don't stop fighting. Um, and so, so to me, I think as challenging as it is, that it's really important for people who are white to move through and to recognize that it's way, 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 way harder for people of color who have the experience. What you have is the story. They've got the experience. We've got the experience. Um, and it may be that sometimes it's like, I have some days in doing this work that in between my work, I walk out and I sit on the ground in front of my house. I just sit on the ground and I just breathe a little bit. Um, and then I come back in and I pull it up because, because I have to. And because this has got to stop. And, and I can't stop until it stops. And, and for someone who is white to recognize it's still going. It's still going for people of color. And so... Um, and so breathe, pull it up, but keep going. And to understand that unless you hear the lived experiences, unless you see what is happening, you will eventually forget that it's going on. But people of color don't forget because it just keeps happening. Amira, thanks. So um, thank you, Dr. Ecker. Well, I kind of chuckled a little bit. I'm sorry, because it's stressful. It's going to feel stressful. It's a, it's a stressful thing. And when you have conversations around conflict anyway, you can't expect, well, you have to expect the discomfort to come. And I think, you know, like a shorter version of what Dr. Eckers just said was to me is basically, you know, there's this little meme or quote floating around on Facebook that is about, um, how young children should learn about anti-racism or racism, period. And it's like, you know, people are wondering, when should white kids learn about racism? When little black kids, they are like born into it. We live it, like our, our kids live it every day. And so there, there's no way of getting to the end of this without that stress. It is uncomfortable. I mean, another thing floating around Facebook now is like, you sometimes you need to take a day off just for being black. I mean, it's hard, it's tiring, there's videos. It's, it's quite frankly, I'm watching um, the, the latest person who's been injured 
and I'm looking at a family member speak about him and I'm in my head wondering, when will it be the day that I'm the one who has to speak for someone in my family? That is stress and that is reality. It is being in my car and wondering if we ever get stopped Will they take my kids out? Will my kids have to go to foster care? Will they arrest my husband? That's stress. Wondering whether I can walk out of a conversation because it feels uncomfortable, <laughs> that's not even really stress, to be honest. Living and talking is two different things. So I guess what I want to say is those conversations are difficult. Four in a week is really difficult if, you're, if there's not something that you normally be all, all the time. It's hard and from any perspective, but I would hope and I guess that's why you're having these town meetings, is that those are the conversations that have to happen so that 50 years from now, our kids are not watching TV and saying, wow, this was 100 years ago that that happened, and look, we're still in the same space. People are still being murdered by the police. I still can't live where I wanna live. And so that's why those conversations are difficult and they're necessary. And, and I can't speak for a white person, but I would say that, that moment where you can get up and leave, know that there are people who live it who can't ever get up and leave. It's our life. Well, I'll try to speak for a, 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 a white person that I think is a great role model, and that's Andrew Cutt at the Oneness Family School. So Terry, the other night, uh, his staff was really being hit and his leadership team with some very serious stories about parents or or former parents and now board members whose children had experiences of racism at his school. And his school's, you know, International Peace School. And Andrew listened with empathy. He thanked people for sharing and it ended up with him saying each time, this is not going to happen anymore at the school. We're going to commit ourselves. So it was an empathic response of listening. It was an appreciation of people sharing their story, their very intimate and painful stories leading to we're going to put in action some things that this doesn't occur in this school. So that's, that's, how, he, that's how he responded as, as a white person. And I thought it was really uh, great, great modeling, honestly. I, I think what I'm hearing is to realize the difference between talk and experience. And I, I, don't, I don't know what we can say. You know, after I've had a lot of conversations, it's just um, being tenderhearted it's like, my word, people are hurting. They're just hurting. And what can we do? What can we do? Yeah. You know, you wanna reach out, but really, what can we do? And I think that's that move to action that is so important. But what is it we can do as white folk? Thank you, Terry. I wanna go to Natasha and then to Sarah. Thank you, because my, my um, response was actually, Terry, and in, in to your, your question as well. Um, and I, I want to share, um, and I want you and I want just white people in general also to examine your motivation. Please, please do that. Um, examine why you are trying to help. Um, specifically look at, are you, are you trying to help because of shame or guilt? Um, please, please throw that out the window. Please throw that because we don't need to be saved. We, we don't. We're good there. We don't need to be saved. So let that go. Um, figure out, are you in this? Because right now a lot of things are going on and it's in the news and it's prevalent. But understand what was a little bit shared. We've been experiencing this for a very, very long time. You guys are just kind of getting with it a little bit. For some, a little bit longer, but trust me when I say we have been experiencing this for a long time, and right now it's a little bit more traumatic for us because it's now been re-triggered for us. So that's what we are feeling and experience. So if it's shame and it's guilt, let that go. We do not need to be saved, and I'm speaking with all the passion that I possibly can give you so that you understand that. Figure out what your motivation is for you wanting to be our allies and our co-conspirators because that's what we need and that's what we want, but we don't need to be saved. We want you to join us because we need partnership. That's what we need. And then go ahead and look and do some research and figure out what you can do because then we also get tired of that. Like, what can we do for you? No, what can we do to help you? No, we get tired of that question too because we're tired. Yes, yes, we're very tired. 
because it is overwhelming and it is stressful and we get tired of turning on the news. That's draining for us. And so then when you ask us, how can you help? That's tiring because sometimes we're trying to figure that out for ourselves. We're trying to help ourselves and then trying to help you help us. No, you go figure that out because you figure out a whole lot of things. Go figure that part out too because we get tired of that part. We will partner with you and we want you to join us, but we don't want to figure out those things too. So let's partner and we want the empathy. We want the love. We want the support, but stop asking all of those questions because you can figure some things out and present that to us. And we'll say, yes, that's great. Come on, let's do that. That's what, that's what we want, but stay in it. Don't let it be something because things calm down and then you walk away. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Stay in this fight with us because that's how it's going to work. That's how it was 56 plus years ago. Stay in it because that's how it's going to change. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you, Natasha. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I appreciate you being here and sharing very much. Um, we have Sarah. Sarah wanted to talk and uh, then I think we're going to Christina and then Fred. And, and then we should probably join the march before yes, it's over. we should. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so Terry, I just wanted to address the stress as a white woman to white woman, because I do think when you say, what do we do? That question can come to me because I live this daily. I, I actually have a black son, but it's, it, that's, I, 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 get, I get to live in uh, that worry. So I understand why I, ha why I as a white woman have to stay in it. And I think that um, the first thing, I think that the first thing you have to do when you say, what do I do? I, I highly encourage you to just every day stay in those conversations, develop the muscle of, of hearing the truth and believing it. If you ever feel yourself want to say, oh, but what did that person do to, des to deserve it? Or what, if you ever find your mind tripping back to scenarios that blame the, the person who got hurt, you gotta pull that back in and say, okay, I have to believe the truth of what this is saying because I feel it hurts. I wanna, I don't want to hurt, so I want to do these things. You gotta exercise that muscle that can, that can manage the pain. It's like lifting weights. It hurts to lift weights, right? But, but people who wanna build up muscle still lift those weights. We need to lift the weight of believing what our black citizens are going through. Our, our, our black citizens are hurting, as you're saying, and it's real. And we have to, as white people, just clear ourselves out of the way. We have to give them space to have voice, give them space to be believed and, and say what they're experiencing is not okay. And we are we are propagating that we as white people are supporting it and it's that muscle we have to as white people keep exercising so our, so that our weariness of our version our version of weariness doesn't take precedent over the sorry i get choked about it but the reality of the weariness of our black citizens that their weariness is is as as you're saying is is pain they and and fear fear for them their children fear for themselves fear for what is going to happen we have a very different life and we have to exercise that muscle and i appreciate that four times last week was a lot and my hope for you is that you can you keep working that muscle so that it, at some point soon you're actually having that conversation seven days a week because you find little pockets where you can say, wow, I just realized, I think we just had, we just experienced something. We just saw something on television that blamed the victim, that took the scenario and said, but he, blah, 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 but his past, blah, 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 when none of it actually had any merit. And when you draw your attention to that and you can go, wow, I did it every day, like Cindy was saying, how have you worked against it? We are exercising those muscles and we are becoming better white people because we're believing the truth of what's happening. So I guess. Thanks, Sarah. I, I recognize that I skipped over Kitty because everybody wanted to respond to Terry. So I'm gonna go back to Kitty if you still have a 
comment and then Amira and then we're going to throw it back to Cindy. And I'm, I'm just going to scoot one quick thing in just before she speaks, which yeah. is that um, last week when we saw the video of the five year old and the six year old who yeah. got arrested. Um, and I had questions from people who, who really wanted to know the, the information behind it, the what did they do. Um, and I didn't want to just give that to you because you don't arrest a five year old and a six year old. And I wanted you to get that. It wasn't about what did they do? What would they do that would cause a five or six year old black child to be arrested? It just, it just wasn't appropriate. It was wrong. And there was no, there was no rationale. There was no reason behind, behind it that would be justified. Kitty? Um, well, what I was going to say a long time ago is, is past. <laughs> no reason to go back there. But I do have something that keeps coming up with me because someone in my life is the person who keeps saying, yes, but he was carrying a knife and the police had to do something. And yes, he fought back and, you know, and, and I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I... I'm frustrated by it. Yeah. You know, there, there is something that permeates throughout the world that if a white person had a knife and a black person had a knife, you must be more fearful of the black person because they're black and have a knife. Yep. Yep. Um, I have seen so many, so many videos of people and arrests, because I've done that because I talk about those kinds of things a lot, um, in which a white person has done a crime that was so exactly similar and that the process was completely different. And, and so it, it's that it's not equal. It's not the same. It's not being dealt with in the same way. And our human perceptions are not equal. Um, we, we have to look at our gut, I mean, which is why our ideologies and our mental models are the thing that shapes us and that moves the decisions that we make, is that we look at something and we judge it. I, it the the anti-bias term drives me bananas because people feel like when they use that, that we can get to a point of anti-bias. We don't. We all have biases. We all have biases. And so to, to throw into to a classroom or a school or anybody's body, the fact that we can have an anti-bias curriculum is absolutely ridiculous. We can push back against bias, but we've got a bias curriculum that pushes back against bias um, because we all have it and it moves how we look at things so that we end up judging the person rather than the system that allows the oppression and the racism to be in place. Thank you. Amira? I thank you. I'm, I know we're running out of time. And I just, I just wanted to offer one last thing. And when we, we we're talking a lot about um, the misuse of police, policing black people, how black people are getting harmed and killed. And that's very big. It's magnanimous. And we all want it to stop right now. But I want to offer that there are all these other things that happen up to that. It's how do we treat, treat our black and brown children in school? How are children, how many children are being suspended? How, how many black people are actually working on your staff? How many black leaders do you have in your organization? Do you use an equity audit when you are hiring people into your organization? You know, all of those things also are very important. So when you think about all the bigness of police brutality and people getting killed, all of those things that Dr. Egger just talked about, Five and six year olds, I don't care what color they are, should be getting arrested for anything ever. What could they possibly do that you can't pick them up, move them and sit them in a chair? I mean, what, what can they do? And so we need to think about all those, that, that's the work, that's the everyday work of who is being represented here, who is being harmed here, who is benefiting from these decisions that we're making as leaders, as leaders either as teachers of organizations in your church groups, in your synagogue group, and wherever, are you asking these questions over every decision that's being made? And that's kind of where a lot of this starts. And so it gets up to the bigger part of 
police brutality and who's getting killed, but all those little things along the way, we have to disrupt that as well. So I just wanted to offer that. So if you don't think you can stop police brutality today, but you sure can see who is leading your, your favorite organization, who is making decisions for your families, who is making decisions for you and the black people on your street. So I just wanted to offer that. Thank you. I won't raise my hand again. <laughs> Thank you, Amira. <laughs> You're always welcome to raise your hand, but what we find every week is that we just, uh, I'm sorry that everyone didn't get a chance to, um, to speak today who wanted to. Please use the chat feature um, and look at saving the chat and you can go back later and, and review that and all of the resources are there. I'm going to send it back to Cindy because I know she has things she wants us to see before we all close and go in a different direction. Yeah, and anyone who has not been on the town halls, I would say watch the last five have been about the children and the classroom. And um, so they're recorded and you can connect in. Um, and oh, sorry, we still Foundation have a YouTube channel in case they're looking for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we still have so much. We always have so, so much more to no. say. <laughs> um, but, but I want you to be a part of the March on Washington. That's just my thing. And so, um, Sarah, can we join in? To show you that what people are out there marching for today is exactly what he was calling out you know, 57 years ago. So it's, uh, when you think about that, a lot of time has passed, but a lot of the same issues are at the forefront of people's minds right now. Okay, yeah. Let's go to David Every Montgomery. now and then I lose them, but it's mostly uh, in right we'll now. turn down our microphones there. I think I hear our correspondents in the field and we'll go to them in just a moment. But first, I want to bring David Montgomery into the conversation, who wrote a piece for the Washington Post magazine looking at the genesis of this event, uh, looking at both the history of that, uh, that march that Rhonda was talking about, the original march on Washington, but also how this march came about. David, hello. Hello. Good to see uh, you. So, David, yeah, tell us about the, tell us about the story of how this started. Well, Al Sharpton actually in his, in his speech talked a little bit about it. He was at the uh, memorial service for George Floyd and he was reflecting in the moment that here he was in front of another, uh, was the other big reason uh, sort of why this march was the genesis for, for those folks. Now they're from, they're from an older school of, of, of activism and, and um, but I think they, they proved their point in my opinion. Let's go to Nicole Ellis, who's been reporting from the National Mall today. Nicole, what is it like to be there uh, at such a, a big moment? Thanks, Libby. It is a truly remarkable and historic moment. Uh, thousands of people are behind me making their way to the Martin Luther King Memorial after, as, as, as you all have noted, a litany of speakers who are members of a club that none of the mothers, daughters, brothers, sisters, sons, and, you know, really are a part of a club of of uh, people who have lost their loved ones or, or saw their loved ones uh, shot or suffocated on camera for the nation to see. You know, it's, it's as you can hear, there still, you know, people are still marching, people are uh, chanting behind me. And today, you know, you could kind of sense the, the relationship with both the past, but also that this is a historic moment in and of itself, having heard from all of those people. Uh, you know, one of the, the points that stood out to me as a reflection on the past and, and, and how this is a moment of accountability and, and reckoning with our country's history is when Reverend Al Sharpton mentioned that he, he asked uh, Dr. Eric Michael Dyson, you know, why the Lincoln Memorial? for the 1963 uh, March on Washington. Why not Jefferson? Why not George Washington? And his response was, well, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and he promised that if black people fought in the, in the army and, and served the Union and preserved the Union, that, uh, that they would be free, that they would get 40 acres and a mule. And they never got that 40 acres and a mule. And, you know, that a part of this is reckoning with some of those un, unresolved promises or broken promises and revisiting American history and revisiting um, and revisiting the past in order to create a more equitable future. So it'll be interesting to see how things unfold, both, you know, at the voting box, as we obviously heard so many of our speakers are, are, are saying that, that right now the most important thing is to, you know, to demonstrate and to stand out and to, to let people know that you can, that, 
people are more than willing to stand in the heat uh, to march as a demonstration and symbolism and representative of what they're willing to do at the ballot box if they are compelled to, if they are obligated to, because they can't mail their ballots in. Libby, you know, you know, as I as I look around and reflect on yesterday's conversations with people from Oregon, Wisconsin, Utah, Texas, now, um, you know, all over the country, it'll be really interesting to see how this moves the needle in America if it does move the needle, and what are some of the changes that. You you know, maybe a reflection of thoughts and and meditation on where we're at and where the people who are here today expect the country to go, Libby. I'll keep you posted as things continue to unfold here. Thanks so much, Nicole Ellis, reporting live down on the National Mall. Thanks, uh, Eugene Scott. Thanks, Sarah. Let's talk about voting, the power of voting, and what we heard from speakers today. So when this is over, you need to try to find where they are in the march because this is, um, that was the reporter, but um, I want you to just watch the march. We are going to end with um, Bibi Winans who um, sang a piece just before everyone started to go out to march. Um, and I want to tell you that next week we're going to uh, we're going to continue this discussion. We were supposed to be talking about leadership um, in with teachers of color, but we're going to finish this um, part about assessing our organization, and then we'll move into that. Um, this coming Sunday, um, there is a 12-hour, 150th anniversary of Maria Montessori. Um, and there are a number of speakers. I'm one of the speakers. I will be up. I'm just letting you know that I will be up. I think I'll be speaking sometime around five. We video recorded and then there are discussions and I'm gonna be awake for the discussion. Um, and I invite you to, um, to just be a part of some part of that history. Um, I don't know that I've ever heard, heard of something going on for 12 hours, but it starts um, Eastern time, it is I believe it's 3 a.m. and yeah. on the West Coast it's 12 a.m. Um, bless you if you uh, decide that you're gonna. Yeah, if you you can still it. register. It's free. It's Montessori everywhere. And uh, yes, yeah, we hope everybody participates. Andy, I, I have lost the video. My my uh, oh, no. internet my, that that window crashed. It froze. So I'm trying to okay. get it back up again. Okay, and while, okay. while Sarah is looking for that in our last couple of minutes, I started the uh, meeting by introducing um, a couple of our colleagues from American Montessori Society. I'd like to acknowledge uh, that Munir Shivji is here. He's also um, on the call with us today, and he is the executive director of the American Montessori Society, and we welcome you, Munir, and happy, very happy to have you with us today. Um, and since we're talking about organizations and associations, I think this is one of those issues that really does transcend any organizational affiliation. This is something that we all as Montessorians are, are called to, uh, to do, and we, are, and we are all doing it within our organizations, but, but I appreciate that we have um, had the opportunity to collaborate and to you know, invite each other uh, to participate together. And I look forward to any future opportunities for collaboration. I think this issue, again, transcends all. So thank and you. And Kathy, if, if I can call this out um, more, mm -hmm. I would say, I would say that the, the work that has to do with social justice also has to do with domination and partnership. And that um, I, I want to call this out to, to your associations, and I'm saying your because I'm speaking to um, several associations here. I want to call it out that your work is to partner. Your work is to connect. Your work is to stop doing things in a silo. Your work is that the first place that you go is to the other associations to say, how can we do this together? Or we came up with this idea. Can we partner with you? That, that is the work. It's, it's stopping the us and themness. It's stopping the otherness that is so pervasive in racial challenges that, that we're facing now, that there's not an other, that there's an us, and that we all have to look at that. I, I can't tell you how much Ursula drilled that into us, that that, that is the 
that's the connection that Montessori made is that 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 it's all of us all of us together and all of us it's going to take that to deconstruct racism it's going to take all of us putting down all of that and being able to work together because we've got to switch something that is so so long and so harmful and it's going to take forever if we don't do this together we've just got to we've got to I think we accept your challenge, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I can tell by Sarah's face that she's still looking for it. But what's more critical is that you get online and that you, that you find where they are in the march before the day is out and that you know that you've become a part of it, um, that you've been a part of the 57th March on Washington. So thank you so much. We will see you next week, or I may see you before that if you are um, holding your eyes open and watching with Montessori everywhere. Um, if not, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cindy. We appreciate everything. Thank you, everyone who came and participated today. We so appreciate your presence and your sharing today. We will see you next week. <laughs>